go. Okay, hi ladies. Uh, my name is Sheila Stone. I am the owner and uh, president and only employee of Sheila Stone Tours. Um, as you can see, I have delusions of grandeur. Um, and this is a presentation about the joy of British gardens. And I am a garden lover. Um, I am not a master gardener, so don't ask me a lot about what the name of the plants we're seeing is. <laughs> I'm sure we can find out from someone else, but it probably won't be me. So the British are very famous for having wonderful gardens, as you can see, all kinds of wonderful gardens. And part of the reason they have so many, so many good gardens is because of the weather, um, which we're having right now. Um, and we're going to start out talking about some gardens in London. This is one of my very favorites. This is Christchurch Greyfriars Garden. And Christchurch Greyfriars is a Christopher Wren designed church that was hit by an incendiary bomb in World War II. So it, it was destroyed. Um, and in the 80s, they decided to put a garden in the center part of the church. So two of the walls are still there, the tower is still there. And what they've done is they've put this lovely garden um, and it's right behind St. Paul's. It's definitely in an urban area. You can see to the left, there's sort of a colony kind of thing. And um, that colony kind of thing is actually where the columns were in the church, inside the church, and where the walkway is, where the lady is standing, um, that it was the central aisle of the church. And it's an absolute beautiful thing. It's always full of flowers. Um, of course, they change depending on the season, but it is, it's very lovely. These are some flowers, uh, pictures of flowers I took while I was there. Another place is the Museum of the Home. Now, it's mainly, obviously, about homes. It has um, interiors from middle-class Londoners' homes through the past 400 years. But in the back, it has, a, it has period gardens. Uh, this particular part of the garden is a, a rooftop garden, which is a rather new um, entry to this, but it's got, um, I'm going to move this. I can't see what I'm doing. Hold on, ladies. Bear with me. Oh, okay. Let's just move that up there. Okay. It's got an Edwardian garden. It's, it's got uh, this lovely herb garden, which smells so lovely, a Victorian knot garden. And it's got a greenhouse and uh, greenhouses became very popular in the Victorian times because they were suddenly a little more affordable. And here are some flowers from there. Um, and it's, uh, the next place we're gonna talk about is Kensington Roof Gardens. Now this is literally on the roof of a uh, tall building in uh, South Kensington. And now, as you can see, it opened in 1938. So it was pretty high tech for back then. Um, and it was bought by Virgin in 1981. And for a long time, it was open to the public. And there were, there was an Italian garden, there was a Spanish style garden, there was an English style garden, and it was all on like the 10th floor of this uh, skyscraper. There were um, flamingos, um, birds came there. Um, and Virgin turned the tea room into a nightclub and party space, which was sort of the beginning of the end. So you have this beautiful garden, and then you have this. Mm. So it went like that for a while, and then they closed it in 2018. Um, now, I only got to go there once. You could go for free, but then as it became more of a party and banqueting space, uh, you couldn't go if there was something going on. Um, and you couldn't get tickets in advance. So I only did get to go once, but they, they are saying that there it might reopen, which would be fabulous because it was beautiful and it was a piece of history and it makes me very sad to think it closed. Um, one of my very favorite gardens in London, London isn't known as a garden city, <laughs> but there's a lot of gardens if you know where to look. Now, one of my favorites is called the Sky Garden. Uh, see where the red arrow is? That's basically where the Sky Garden is. And this picture was taken from 
there, which is the shard. Um, and so they're on either side of the Thames. That muddy looking thing there is the Thames, which, believe it or not, although it looks very muddy, is actually the quite unpolluted and quite <laughs> clean. It used to be very polluted. Um, it's muddy because there is a 25 foot differential between high and low tide. So it just constantly churns up um, the mud. Um, this is inside the Sky Garden. Um, and it's beautiful. It's the top three stories of this building, which is called the Walkie Talkie for obvious reasons. This is one of the views from the Sky Garden. As you can see, there's the Tower of London, there's Tower Bridge. Um, it's a, it does have wonderful views. This is out the side. You can see the little point of the gherkin. Um, and it's a wonderful place to go for um, sunsets. And this is looking down on top of the gardens. The British get very excited about things like tropical gardens because, you know, living in California, it's a little bit like, yeah, okay, tropical pl plants. But there, it really is a thing. You know, they can't grow them outdoors very easily. Um, this is an experience I had um, at the Sky Garden. This gentleman here, his name is Richie, and he is a friend. I've known him since 2010. We met in Spain at an, at an, when I was doing the English school. He was one of the people that worked for it. Um, and he lives in Brighton. I live in Los Angeles. I was at the Sky Garden for the very first time in my life, walking up the stairs, and I heard somebody call my name. And I turned around and it was him. He happened to be in town with his niece showing her the Sky Garden at the same time I was there. Absolutely bizarre. Really delightful, though. Now, this is a different kind of garden. This was founded in 1673. It's called a Physic Garden. It was created by the, um, what is it, the Royal Order of Apothecaries. Um, it was created as a medicinal garden because back in 1673, that was basically medicine. And this was this garden was created and amazingly is still here um, as a way to grow medicinal herbs and not only for use, but also to teach other apothecaries, you know, how to uh, turn these herbs into medicines. And there were beautiful flowers there as well. Um, and um, I, I happened to be there in November, so it wasn't as lush as it might have been. This surprised me, though. Um, UK grape growing. Who knew? Um, but they do have, actually, they do have vineyards in Cornwall and award-winning wines, so I've heard. Um, so this is all the, the um, Slow physic day. garden. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite gardens in the world. Uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Um, they're just outside of London. Um, absolutely stunning and so many things to see there. Um, it's about more than just plants, although, of course, the plants are gorgeous. No matter what time of year you go, there's always beautiful plantings um, to the left there. That is um, a the palm house. It is very old. It is also very wet, as you can see. Um, and this is what happens when you walk into the palm house, especially on a chilly day. And I've done it more than once, as you can see by the different glasses. Um, you know, you just walk in and it's like immediate, oof, can't see a thing. Um, and because of all that dampness, you also have things like rust and they can't keep, I mean, they paint it, of course, but it just, it's a losing battle. <laughs> so depending on when you go, it either is more rusty or less rust rusty, but I like to think of it as sort of faded Victorian elegance. Uh, there are beautiful uh, spiral staircases. This is my friend Kelly. She went with me the last time I was at Q. And there is a walkway around the top. So you can literally go up into the treetop area of the, um, the gardens. Now, this isn't here anymore, and it really saddens me. Um, there it was this walkway going down, and they had a marine aquarium underneath the, the palm house. Um, it, the, I'm sure the, built, the rooms are still there, but it, they closed the aquarium a while ago. And as you can see, some of these plants have been here a while. This one looks like it's trying to escape. 
Um, and that's true about all of the plants, or not all, but a lot of the plants at Kew are very old. This tree, in order to prevent it from falling over, many years ago, they literally built a wall and it sort of just sort of lent over the wall, leaned, I guess, over the wall. And now the wall is a part of the tree. And you can see it's a very old and a huge tree. Uh, they do have an amazing rose garden. Uh, beautiful, stunning roses, depending, of course, on what time of year you go. But I found this really fascinating. This is, was one of the times I went. I'd never seen rose hips that size. Um, and apparently that was a really big resource during the war because um, of the vitamin C content in the rose hips. And uh, they made rose hip syrup um, from 2,000 tons. Think about that of rose hips harvested by volunteers. And that helped keep um, not only adults healthy, but certainly it affected the health of children. Um, and this is my friend Deb, who is very delighted to be among roses. One of the wonderful things about Q, because it's quite large, is you can get on the tram. It's a hop on, hop off tram and go around the gardens. So you don't have to do all that walking because it's a big place. Um, this is the Great Pagoda. Uh, it's quite fascinating. It was built in 1762. At the time it was built, uh, the Brits had never seen anything like it. They were convinced it was going to fall over because it just didn't look like any building they were familiar with. Uh, this is what it looks like on the bottom. And isn't he magnificent? Um, this was, um, obviously they've repainted and gilded him um, over the years, but I think he's just, I, I quite love dragons and I think he's gorgeous. Um, inside, um, unfortunately, I didn't get any video, but this is an automaton. So it literally shows the, the, um, the, the building being built um, in an, an you know, you crank it and then everybody moves. I thought it was just amazing. They had quite a few of them in the base of the building. Um, the lily house. I love lilies, uh, water lilies. Um, here they are. They're just beautiful, depending, again, on what time of year you go. Uh, I thought this was particularly fascinating. Um, one of the leaves had come loose and they turned it upside down so you could see what it looks like on the bottom um, and what the uh, the pods look like. Um, we were there one time when some one of the women was, one of the workers was cleaning the pond, and I like where she kept her walkie-talkie. <laughs> keep, it, keep it from getting wet. Um, I was also there a few years ago when, uh, if you know, are familiar with the glass artist, the American glass artist, Dale Chihuly. Um, this is, um, he had a number of exhibits in the garden, and it was just stunning. Uh, I'm quite a big fan of Jehuli, and apparently they're right now going on in Milwaukee. I think it's Milwaukee. No, St. Louis. St. Louis. Um, the Botanic Gardens there have a Chihuly exhibit. Uh, this is the Temperate House, and it was closed for a number of years. They completely took it apart and put it back together. But it is the biggest Victorian glass house in the world. It's massive. This picture does not do it justice. Um, again, you can walk around the outside. There's a spiral staircase. This was taken during the Chihuly exhibit. So you can see all the lovely glass bits kind of tucked in among the, um, the plants. Um, it's interesting when they work on those, they have to, of course, remove all of the plants and put keep them in a place where they will be safe and where they won't, you know, die while they're working on uh, repairing the building. So that's not something they do lightly or often. Um, I particularly liked this because, you know, of course, I, I love cl uh, color in gardens. And we think of color as always being flowers, but not necessarily. Look at these beautiful, beautiful leaves um, and the different shapes that the leaves can, can have. Um, now, this is uh, one of the most recent glass houses. This, if not the very most recent, uh, this is the Princess of Wales Conservatory. Um, interestingly, this is the Princess of Wales they're referring to is not Diana, uh, although she opened it. 
um, in 87. Um, but it's the Princess of Wales they're referring to is uh, Augusta, who was the mother of George the Third. Text, my Uber code. Did you say? Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, Augusta was the mother of George the Third. You know, the guy we had the little tip with back in 1776. <laughs> Um, and she was the founder of Kew Gardens. So, um, but of course, people get confused. They think that they're, it's talking about Diana, but they do have a plaque commemorating her life. Um, if you're talking to your Uber person, maybe you could put yourself on mute, please. Um, okay, and it has 10 microclimates in this area. So you get to go from everything from a desert to a temperate climate to... Um, just uh well there's an orchid house um and it's all connected with stairs and walkways um there are lots of of course beautiful plants little bitty guys look how tiny that little flower is and it's absolutely perfect um lots of uh, i got a kick out of the spanish moss uh having grown up in florida it was like oh spanish moss okay <laughs> we thought of it as a weed um but it is quite evocative when you see it hanging. Um, there are a few uh, aquariums in there um, with aquatic plants and also some terrariums um, and a beautiful orchid house. Look at these orchids. Aren't they gorgeous? Um, and there are more lilies because you can never have too many lilies. Um, and I love this because you can see how all those lily pod, uh, lily pads come out from a central plant. Um, outside of the Princess of Wales um, uh, Conservatory is a rock garden, which is lovely to walk through. I'm quite a fan of waterfalls. And also the Alpine House. Now, the Alpine House is um it's not very big it's quite tiny as you can see my friend walking into it and what they do is they keep the plants because the plants are very delicate and they they need to be in a specific kind of um uh environment so they keep the plants off site in a um uh, in uh climate controlled environment and only bring out the ones that are flowering, leave them out there for a short period of time and then take them back so the plants will not be harmed. But look how beautiful and tiny they are. They're just gorgeous. So whenever you go, it's always something different because um, they only bring out the plants as they flower and then they put them back into a safe place. Um, the treetop walkway is another area of Q, which puts you obviously among the treetops. Um, it looks, you can take the stairs up, but they also have an elevator, which is nice. Um, as you can see, you can get up there even if you um, are in a mobility scooter. This is from underneath. Um, and it's just lovely to, to walk among there and to see all of the, the tops of the trees, the parts that we normally don't get to see. And along the walkway, there are these pieces of art with pithy sayings. Um, and um, yes, it's one of my favorite areas. Now, I particularly love the kitchen garden, uh, partly because it's beautiful and partly because the cafes at Kew Gardens grow a lot of their uh, produce in the kitchen garden. Uh, so it's I like to eat. So here are some of the plants. Uh, there are some apples and there are some tomatoes. And this walkway is all lavender. So imagine yourself walking down this walkway and, you know, just brushing against all of that lavender and the scent was just stunning. This is something I've never seen anywhere else. This is called the hive. Um, it's You can see a, a teeny little person there. So it's quite large. Um, you can go inside. Um, and it is an immersive sight and sound experience. Now, this has to do with bees. But it's connected to uh, beehives that are off-site. Um, so the bees aren't here. 
which would disturb them and disturb some of the people who who come to see. But what you do, and I don't know if they do this anymore because you know of COVID, but you would get a stick. Uh, it looked like a popsicle stick, and this was underneath the whole thing. You take the popsicle stick, you put it between your teeth, plug your ears, and you could hear the buzzing. I'm not quite sure how. Obviously, it was very low tech. And then when you were done, you just, it says, you know, sticks, was it stick slot? You could just throw your used stick away. This is, this picture on the right is looking up through the, um, the bottom. So it was down at the very bottom where I was sitting and looking up at the Oculus. Um, now, of course, in addition to plants, they have animals. Um, I this bird just cracked me up. Look at the size of his feet. He just looked like he was put together by a committee. Um, and they were all over the place. Oh, I guess I put this one in twice. Okay. One of the things that was really interesting, and you can't quite get the feel of it, but this was almost like a dome made from the branches of the trees. And you could walk in and literally you were surrounded on all sides by these weeping branches. Um, and it was huge, it was gorgeous. Um, now, leaving um, Kew Gardens, we are going to Kensington. Now this particular garden here, Kensington Gardens is like a, li a large park and it's connected to Hyde Park. Um, so it's kind of one really big park um, in the middle of the city. This is gardens that are connected to um, the Kensington Palace. And this particular area is called the Sunken Gardens, and it was a particular favorite of Princess Diana. And you walk through this um, lovely green archway to, to view the gardens. You can't walk in the Sunken Gardens. You can just look at them. Um, this is looking out from that walkway onto the, the regular part of um, Kensington Gardens. Um, and just last year, I believe it was, uh, Princes Harry and William uh, had this statue created and dedicated to their mother. And it now looks over the garden, which was a favorite of hers. Um, as you can see, you can see it from several different places, but you can't go up to it. This is as close as you can get, um, is looking behind it, but then you can go to the side and look at it. Um, but I found that very poignant. Um, one of the things they have at Kensington Gardens, which I believe is finally open now, they had it closed for several years to restore it, um, is the Orangery. And this literally was a place where Queen Anne had oranges grown uh, for her own use and for the use of the palace. Um, and they serve a bang up afternoon tea. <laughs> and if you go to the tea, if you go and get afternoon tea there, and the prices are quite reasonable, particularly if you compare it to places like um, the Claridge's or Brown's or any of the really high-end hotels, which can cost you a fortune to have afternoon tea. The prices here are quite, quite reasonable. And um, you don't need to tell them that Kate wasn't pouring unless you really feel like you want to. You can just say you had tea at the palace. Um, also, as you, you can see, Kensington is very famous for its headless swans. Now, I, um, this is also in Kensington Gardens. This is the Albert Memorial. And Albert, uh, the statue of the guy in the middle, he was, he was the prince consort to um, Queen Victoria. They had, by all accounts, a wonderful marriage. Uh, they had a lot of children. Um, and he died quite young. He died when he was 42. And he didn't want any memorial um, created for him. And as you can see, Queen Victoria absolutely followed that to the letter. <laughs> this is a monument to Victorian excess. Um, but it is beautiful. And as you can see by the little teeny tiny people, it is massive. And right across the street from it is the Royal Albert Hall. That whole area used to be called Albertopolis because he was a mover and shaker about uh, bringing uh, industry and um, 
starting industries in Britain. Now, London has a many garden spaces. As I said, it's not a garden um, city. It's not considered a garden city, really. But there are a lot of wonderful places if you know where to look. Um, this is on the embankment. Uh, those Victorians, they really loved a good Magdalen statue. So here we are being all Magdalen. Um, and in Paddington, there is this thing called the Pocket Park. And as you can see, it's surrounded by offices and by apartments. <clears throat> and it's literally floating on the water. And there are little places where you can go and you can sit and sit among the flowers and have your, you know, have a little picnic. Um, and it's quite lovely. Um, another place which isn't exactly a garden um, is Crossbones Graveyard. And Crossbones Graveyard um, was the area outside the city at the time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, during medieval times. And it was where the the non the non posh people went it was for paupers it was for prostitutes it was unconsecrated ground which was particularly ironic since a, the, a lot of those prostitutes were licensed by the um the oh gosh what we archbishop i guess of winchester um and they were called winchester geese so he was fine getting the money off of them, but he wasn't going to provide them with a place, uh, consecrated ground to be buried. Um, this was found, um, I don't know if it was ever lost, but fairly recently, um, people in the neighborhood decided that it needed to be honored, and this was created. Um, it's the Cross Bronze Graveyard. Um, it is a... As you can see, you can walk through it. It's quite lovely. Um, and it's a way to pay respect for those people who were outside of the realm of um, society at the time. Um, another very favorite place of mine is the Churchill Arms. Um, they are famous for covering their pub in flowers. And apparently, uh, Winston Churchill's grandparents actually used to drink there. Um, so they named it the Churchill Arms. It is, this is what it looked like when I was there last year. Um, and this is what they do at Christmas. It's literally covered in Christmas trees. Um, it costs them a fortune, and um, but people come from all over to see it. And they also have very fine food and drink. Although, oddly, it's not traditional pub fare, it's a Thai restaurant. Who knew? Now, going a little further afield, this is heading up north. This is uh, the Skipton um, Cottage Garden. This is, um, that building there is where I stay when I'm in Skipton. And I used to live in Skipton when I went to grad school in Leeds. And this is the Quaker um, compound. But the, to the right, the, the building you can see is the uh, the home and um, a, like an informal meeting room. And then to the left where we can't see, um, which is right there, um, is the actual meeting house. And that meeting house was purpose built as a Quaker meeting house and has been used as such for over 350 years. And the garden is one of my very favorite spots in the world. Uh, it's a wonderful place to sit. It changes from season to season. Um, so many beautiful flowers. I house sat in 2017. I was there for four months while my friends were um, off camping for uh, taking a sabbatical. And I got to be there in the spring when things were coming up. And um, it just made me happy. And here's my delightful lunch. Two pork pies and some Brussels sprouts. <laughs> And a cup, I think that's a mug of soup. I thought it was tea, but I do believe that is a mug of soup. Um, but the the flowers were just gorgeous. I just can't get enough. Um, and um, while I was there, I was taking care of getting the meeting house ready for uh, Sunday morning meetings. And one of my duties was to pick some of the flowers and put them into a vase so that there were pretty flowers in the meeting house, which made me very delighted. Um, 
This picture is outside of Skipton, and this is not the only place in the country that has this, but in the spring, this is called Bluebell Woods. And in the spring, the bluebells uh, come up, and this particular woods is wonderful because nobody can reach it. Um, I took this from the canal, and uh, people can't reach it, so they can't go through and stomp on them. <laughs> So you can only see it from the canal or from the towpath next to the canal, which is on the other side of the canal, and um, they are just stunning. Another one of my favorite places is Skipton Castle Woods. This is Skipton Castle. It is over 900 years old, and this is the view from the castle looking down into the walkway heading into the woods, and this is from the walkway. Um, a fairly recent addition is this wonderful huntswoman uh, made out of willow, which I, I just think she's magnificent. Um, as you walk along the walkway, there's a waterfall. Um, these, I just thought these flowers were so pretty. They're seed pods, I guess, really. Um, there are uh, places to sit. Um, along the top part, there's a lovely dry stone wall. And it's a little hard for me to look over it because I'm not too tall. But on the other side are sheep <laughs> because Skipton used to be Sheep Town. That's where the name came from. If you go in the spring, um, everything is covered in these white flowers and you walk in and it smells really familiar, but sort of out of place. Well, these white flowers are actually wild garlic. And um, it's amazing. And you can gather them and um, use them to cook with. Um, they are literally, it's, it's garlic. Uh, this is not a garden. I, was, I took this picture myself from the canal boat uh, that I used to volunteer on. And honestly, it looks, to me, it looks like a David Hockney painting. Um, just got lucky. It was uh, good timing. They had just mowed. Um, now, this is Harlow Carr um, Gardens, which is also, it's in uh, Yorkshire as well. I went there last year with a friend. As you can see, by this time, it's starting to be, this was in late September. So it was starting to, um, you know, to kind of turn into fall. Uh, they did have really large leaves on this plant. That's my friend, Sarah, who is considerably taller than I am. So that's one very big leaf. Um, and a lovely little greenhouse. And they had a lot of artwork in this garden, um, different kinds. So here you have, um, there were several deer things made out of uh, what looks like probably scrap metal or a rebar. And then there were um, more willow art. Um, and this guy who I thought was magnificent. <laughs> Fruit and veg man. Um, these are not real fruit and veg because they would have to be massive because he was pretty tall. He was probably about 15 feet tall. And the wonderful thing about Harlow Car Gardens is they have a Betty's Tea House. So when you are done looking at the plants, you can sit down and have a little sweet treat and a cup of tea. Um, now we are going further north. This is Anik Castle. I know it's spelled A-L-N-W-I-C-K, but it really is Anik. Um, and this is the walkway up to the castle. Now the castle, if it looks familiar, it was used for part of um, Harry Potter for the filming um, where the kids were learning how to fly their brooms. But what the castle is, or the gardens is famous for is this. This is the largest cascading fountain in um, the uh, uh, in the UK, and it's beautiful. This is looking at the top, looking down, and when you get to the very top, there's another little cascading fountain and a walled garden at the very top. Um, <clears throat> so I just love it. It just keeps going on and on. And look at the size of that rose. It's like dinner plate rose. And all the um, the delphiniums and um, uh, ranunculus, maybe. And the bees love it, too, as you can see. Uh, they have sort of a, it looks like a fairy tale garden, so they have some fairy tale stuff 
And it's nice because that really draws in the kids. Um, one of the other features of the, um, the Annick Castle Gardens is the poison garden. And it really is a poison garden. You cannot go in without a guide. And here is the guide who looks fairly innocuous. Um, and people lined up, to, you know, it's like, oh, let's go look at the poison plants. Let's see what can kill anybody. Um, hopefully no Agatha Christie readers. One thing I saw there that I've never seen before or since, was, which was basically sort of the love child of a Roomba and a uh, lawnmower. It was great. It just sort of went around, you know, mowing the grass. They also have a treehouse restaurant nearby, which is just like it says, a treehouse. It's as beautiful in the inside as it is in the outside. And they have flower pot cocktails or watering can cocktails, which were quite good. Going even further north, we are now in Scotland. This is Edinburgh. That is Edinburgh, not Edinburgh. Um, that's how they pronounce it. Um, and it has a number of wonderful gardens as well. This is called Princess Street Garden. And um, it's when it, you'll notice there's no apostrophe in princes, and that's because it was named for two princes. So it literally is princes, plural, street gardens. And that lovely building um, up on the uh, mountain is Edinburgh Castle. One of the things Edinburgh uh, Princess Street Gardens is famous for is it has the oldest floral clock in the world. And it changes every year. Uh, this was um, when it was the UNESCO City of Literature. It still is a UNESCO City of Literature, but this particular year they um, wanted to honor that with the clock. Uh, now you can walk up underneath the castle. That's my son. He and I hiked up. Um, but you get to a certain point and you would have to really do some serious rock climbing. The castle was pretty well suited as a fortress. <clears throat> and this is the, they also have a Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Um, and it was it started out tennis court sized and it's definitely grown since then. And it was a medicinal garden similar to the Chelsea Physic Garden. One thing, one of the things I that is unique to this, uh, certainly nothing like they have at Kew, is they also have a community garden as part of the um the botanic gardens, and they do a lot of community art outreach um, about gardening. Um, to the right there, those are um, solitary bee houses because not all bees live in hives. Who knew? Um, and they have a lot of beautiful, beautiful flowers, as you can see. And of course, they would have a thistle because that is the national flower of Scotland. Uh, they have a tropical palm house, which looks completely different than the ones that you see in um, Kew Gardens, but they're just as damp inside. <laughs> um, and they have a lot of Spanish moss hanging and hanging, uh, beautiful hanging orchids. Um, I put this picture in because to give you an idea, that walkway is not on the ground floor. That is on <laughs> the second floor. So it it's very big. It's very tall, this garden. Um, and we happened to be there when they were cleaning out the, um, the lily pond. Um, so this is the big lily pads. It's a Victoria Longwood hybrid. They're absolutely beautiful. They're so strong that the guy was telling us that people used to set their small children on them. People who worked there um, off hours would set their small children on the lily pads to get pictures. Um, this is why you don't grab one of those lily, pod, lily pads um, underneath the water, because this is what they look like. They are pretty wicked. And as you can see, they're a beautiful uh, koi in the water. Um, the guy was also saying that they have in the past had problems with people who had gotten pet piranhas um, and realized that they don't make the best pets and they would bring them and sort of slip them into the water, which means don't go 
another reason not to to delve into the water because you never know um this is their alpine house looks completely different but has the same sort of thing you'll notice it's open on both ends so that air can go through and of course they bring in the little tiny delicate plants to be shown she was one of the uh, gardeners there um and you can see how it's open so um it keeps the sun off but it it allows air to to move through and there they are working on the garden now in the city of edinburgh there is a wonderful place called dunbar's close it's just off the royal mile and it is if you don't know it's there, it's very easy to miss. It's almost down by Holyrood Palace, but it's a seven. It's designed as a 17th century um, garden, uh, very uh, laid out, very formal. It goes way back. You wouldn't know that. All you can see from the street is just a little gate. Um, and my favorite garden in Edinburgh, which is a little hard to read on this sign, is Dr. Neal's garden. And there is a Neil apostrophe S, but there were actually two Dr. Neils, um, both uh, Dr. Nancy and Dr. Andrew Neil um, created the garden together um, as a labor of love and also as a way for their patients to be able to get out into nature and to experience nature. It's built on this hill that was unsuitable for anything like farming or grazing um, and it overlooks this very very bloomer bloomy harry potter-esque looking lock um now when my friend and i went there it was it's easy to find if you know where it is but it the first time it was really difficult to find um and we finally found it and then we got to the place where it was but we couldn't figure out where the door was to get in and we finally found the door started to go through and found out oh look they're having a wedding reception <laughs> so we tried to find another door and we thought well okay that should work um no the other door was literally going through the reception. And we thought about it and said, you know, we, we've come a long way to see this. So we literally walked through the wedding reception of people we didn't know saying, excuse me, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, we're just here for the garden. Um, and we walked all the way through and got out to the other side uh, where we got to go through the garden. Um, they had it set up for, uh, the people at the reception to enjoy the gardens as well and my friend deb and i had to keep ducking because the wedding couple were out there having their photographs taken and we didn't want to be in the background finally we got far enough away so we were able to walk through the gardens and not be in any inadvertently be in anybody's wedding pictures and it was stunning. Look at this beautiful, it's on a hillside. Um, it was a very windy day, as you can see from the fountain. Um, this was a posed picture. It wasn't quite that windy. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful place, hidden. Um, it was great. Uh, when we left, we went across the street to the Sheep Hide Inn. Um, which as it, it's amazing the number of you know Scotland's oldest pub England's oldest pub Britain's oldest pub um, there are a lot of oldest pubs um, but it was a good place to sit there and have a pint and look at each other and go oh my gosh I can't believe we walked through someone's wedding reception um, one of my it's hard to pick a favorite city in uh, Scotland but uh, I love Edinburgh and I love Glasgow. They're completely different, <clears throat> not very far away from each other, but literally worlds apart. Glasgow is sort of like Edinburgh's um, cooler, edgier, artier sister. Now, this is the um, mascot of the city of Glasgow. In uh, the 80s, someone got the bright idea that underneath that traffic cone is the Duke of Wellington. And someone got the bright idea to pop a traffic cone on his head. Probably there was alcohol involved. Um, and so the city fathers removed it. It appeared again. That went on for years. I mean, literally, the city fathers would take it down. And like, by the next day, the traffic cone would be up. 
So they finally decided they would take the plinth and they would heighten the plinth so that it would be difficult to put the cone on. And within, within 24 hours, a Facebook site called Save the Save the Cone, I think is what it was called. They had over 70,000 members because the city of Glasgow decided they really liked having a traffic cone on the Duke of Wellington's head. Um, and sometimes the, sometimes the horse gets one too. Um, and so basically they gave up and that is now what you see is the, you can buy merchandise with it and all sorts of things. And I think it's magnificent and I long live the cone. Um, this is the um, Glasgow Botanic Gardens, Royal Botanic Gardens. Um, definitely a different look than Edinburgh. You can see the um, the buildings have more of a craftsman style. Um, and that's very in keeping with the city of Glasgow, which was sort of a hub of um, the graf craftsman style stuff back in the, the turn of the previous century. But it also has this um, Kibble Palace, which is another really huge glass house. Um, and the thing that's interesting is uh, that you don't see at uh, any of the other um, uh, botanic gardens I've been to is there's a lot of art. Um, I also love, I love me a good dome. And uh, this is a glass one and it's gorgeous. Look at these. Um, I mean, multiple domes, obviously. Um, but yes, there's a lot of artwork. Now, they were having an art uh, exhibit at the time. Uh, so there was a lot of art showing. And it was, um, it, Glasgow was known for having a lot of art in it. So, uh, and there's sculpture. This is permanent. These sculptures are permanent. I quite like the man with the monkey. Um, and here is the... Um, craftsman style glass house. There are quite a few of those. But the plants and everything, it's beautiful. There's a place where you can walk down and walk along the river. Uh, the River Clyde uh, goes through the Botanic Gardens. And of course, you've got the beautiful flowers as well. Um, so yes. And Ta-da, here we are at the end. Um, this is my contact information. I do have a newsletter. I'd love for you to sign up. You can sign up using the, um, uh, the just sending me an email. Um, I am going to have a garden tour next year. The Joy of British Gardens, there's only 10 spots. Um, we're going to go to Edinburgh and Glasgow, Annick Castle, and we're going to go to um, York. Um, primarily to Castle Howard, which is just outside of York, which is where they filmed both versions of Brideshead Revisited and uh, the Christmas episode of Downton Abbey. Um, and of course, we're going to end up in London. Um, so please join us. Uh, the tour includes a year's membership to the Royal Horticultural Society, which gives you entrance to over 200 gardens, which of course, if you live in the States, that doesn't seem like that's such a great thing, but there's a couple of things about it that will definitely be good. One, we get to get into the Chelsea, world Chelsea, um, world famous Chelsea flower show a day early, which is great because it can be quite crowded and busy. And you get a um, uh, annual um, subscription to their magazine called The Garden. Um, I've got several other tours coming up this year. This is Speed Day to City Santa Fe. We went last year. It was so much fun, as you can see. Um, and we're going to do San Antonio, um, which is another wonderful city, um, and Chicago in June, but hopefully before it gets too terribly hot. Um, and um, next year, we're going to Switzerland in what has got to be the most girly of tours, which is chocolate, cheese, wine, and spa. Who knew they had vineyards in Switzerland? I didn't know. Um, and then this um, this December, we are doing a Christmas time in London tour. So we will see the lights um, and we'll see that wonderful um, uh, pub covered in Christmas trees. Um, I'm leaving in a couple of weeks for Japan or three weeks. And um, here we are. I'm going to do uh, this tour is uh, is 
filled, but I'm going to do a fall tour next year and the following spring going to do another cherry blossom tour, going to do an Austria tour. Um, and I have a packing light book if you're interested and um, a using English to see the world, which I've done a presentation on. Um, and please follow my adventures. Um, I'm going to be going to Japan. I'm going to have lots of cool things I'm going to see, lots of cool things I'm going to eat, and probably lots of odd things I'm going to eat. <laughs> so thank you so much. Let me stop the share. I think that's, yep, that's the end. Stop share. And I am happy to answer any questions. You were great, Sheila. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I did go over. Thank That's you. amazing. <laughs> it went too fast. Uh, it did. Well, I cut a lot out because I, the, to begin with, I had almost 300 slides, and that was, that was probably a bit much. It's hard. It's like killing your babies because I love, I love a good picture. Um, is if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, can we can see a picture of your newsletter again? Oh, yeah, you can just send me a text. It's uh, at toursbysheila at gmail.com. Not a text, I'm sorry, an email, and I'll put you on the newsletter list. Will you provide us with uh, a summary of the gardens that you showed in this presentation? I can. Can uh, you put do it that? into the, the chat. Um, I mean, I can tell you. Let me think. Um, well, I'd be better if you put it into the chat <laughs> and i'll look at it again and make sure okay. i don't miss any okay great yeah um we notice we have to give permission um, that you're going to tape it where can we see the tapes um okay i am going to hopefully get better at putting them up not meaning i haven't put up the ones that i've said i would but like the last one it took me all week and it finally went up today it was from a presentation from last um saturday because I'm not the most techie of people. And for some reason, I got the other one up, but this one didn't go up so well. Um, I mean, the one from last week. So um, hopefully it will be up in a few days. Um, I'm that, hoping I'm going on to your, get better. on your, um, your, your website or your Facebook page or where? It's going to be, I actually have a YouTube channel. Oh, um, okay. Called, uh, it's just YouTube. And if you look up Sheila Stone Tours. Great. Um, okay. The, the uh, packing light is up and the um, using English to see the world is up. Now they're literally, they're raw. I mean, it's, it's like what you just saw. Um, so um, I'm not very good at the editing part yet, maybe someday, but probably not anytime soon. <laughs> so um, until then, we'll just put it up as best I can. Um, is does anyone else have any questions? No question, but thank you so much. Very inspiring, especially in coming up in March, where I get antsy for color and growth. So this is really refreshing. Oh yeah, and the flowers there are just stunning. If you have Brit Box. Um, and I don't know who has it or who doesn't. It's a it's a streaming service. It's like I don't know, six ninety five a month or something. If you have BritBox, the last year's Chelsea Flower Show, there's something like thirteen hours of the Chelsea Flower Show from wow. last year up. Um, so it I I watched some of it. It's very interesting. Um, last year, of course, was the last year that the Queen went to Chelsea Flower Show. So uh, there is one of the episodes, it's it's in episodes. Um, and in one of the episodes, uh, the queen is visiting the flower show for the last time, although people didn't realize it at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that has a lot, that is one of the places we're going to be going is the Chelsea Flower Show. So um, next year, I mean, um, and if anybody has any other questions or anything, I will be looking at the chat, although I don't know if I'll get to, to that today. Thank you so much for coming, ladies. I it would be the, just- you, Did you say your oh. email is toursbysheila at gmail.com? It is. Yes. 
And if you want to follow me on Facebook, like I said, I'm going to be going to Japan in just three weeks. I posted, I post every day or try to, um, and I'm going to be going to Japan in three weeks. So I will be posting quite a bit. Um, you can find me at uh, Sheila Stone Tours on both Facebook and on Instagram. Um, it's weird doing all of this self-promotion, but it's okay, Sheila. You know, you're on YouTube. Inspiring, it's okay. it's inspiring, especially that you have it so far out. We can plan for 2025. Well, you know what? I have a hard time. I used to put them up a lot more, you know, right before kind of a thing. And I was having trouble getting them filled. People go, oh, I really love that tour, but I'm already doing something. So I decided, well, saw this. I'm going to start working far in advance and um, put things up um, far in advance because I love what I do. I love taking women and showing them parts of the world that mean a lot to me. And I want to have women on my tours. Okay. Yes, it's how I make a living, but it's more than that. It's a passion. And, um, you know, especially, you know, sometimes women, especially after COVID, they're not comfortable traveling. I'm there. I'll hold your hand. I'll make sure that you feel comfortable. Um, and if you don't have anyone to travel with, travel with me. Everybody gets their own room. You don't have to worry that you're going to be stuck with someone you don't know. Uh, there's no extra charge for that. Um, I just really love travel and I want to share it. So and she's a bunch of fun and she likes to eat. <laughs> I didn't get this body by turning down food. <laughs> Anna wants to ask you something, Sheila. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, That's Anna. okay. Hi, thanks so much. This was awesome. And I just uh, thought that I saw you were planning a trip to Switzerland. Is that right? Or yes. Uh, okay. it'll be next year. <laughs> I'm gonna check into that wine and spa so we're going to go to a chocolate factory and have a tasting and a tour we're going to have go to a cheese factory and have a tasting and a tour we're going to have raclette which is a special type of uh swiss cheese kind of thing with potatoes and stuff um and i mean you know if you're going to have cheese why not have cheese and carbs um and then we're going to have fondue on top of a mountain we're going to, um, it's, oh, and we're going to spend a day at a spa. So, what, I mean, to me, that's the ultimate early trip. We're going to be in, I think, oh gosh, it's Montreux and is it Lascaux? Mm, uh, look it up on the website. <laughs> um, I can't, you know, I'm, um, old brain, you know, uh, <laughs> trying to, to remember all the bits and bobs, but the, if you go to Sheila Stone Tours on the wetravel.com website, it not only shows you the, the tours that I've got, but each tour has its itinerary up. So you can literally see day to day what's planned. And that's for every tour. So, um, Great, yes. Thanks. Sure. Anybody else? Ready to call it a day? I'm just you glad know I you showed have up one because man? I sign up for you all kinds one. of things and I don't get to half of them. So I'm glad I came here. Oh, well, I'm glad. I'm glad you came too. Mary, what did you say? We had a token man here. We had a token man? Yes. Yes. I was, I'd send oh. you a chat about it, but I mean. So did I. <laughs> oh, well, I, I couldn't see. At least he kept quiet. Yeah, His he was name? fascinated. He was, you know, watching it. You could see him. Yep. Oh, well, if he was, you know, if he was enjoying it and not being a problem, we'll... Do you know a person named Tom Thomas? Nope. Nope. Well, I, I went to school with a guy named Tom Thomas. Well, maybe you know him. <laughs> maybe that's him. Yeah, last, uh, last time I, I went to the, um, the, the Pride Parade, um, at the very beginning, um, there was this older gentleman and, and I told him, I, cause I'm in free mom hugs. So we go and we hug people and, um, this guy said, Oh, can I have a free, uh, a mom hug? And I'm well, sure. So we took a picture, you know, 
And I was showing it to a friend. I go, I really love this picture. And she looked at it and she goes, I know him. Yeah. <laughs> I went to school with him. It's funny. So you never know. Sheila, are you in the P flag organization by any chance? No, I'm in free mom hugs. Oh, well, that's the in P flag. It's parents and friends of lesbians and gays, and they give a lot of hugs too. But that's awesome. Thank you for doing that. It's great. I think, you know, you can never have too many hugs. And that is one of the high points of my year is going and, and giving hugs. I love it. And nice. I now have this wonderful rainbow feather tiara thing. And I love it. People kept saying, I love your hair. It's like, <laughs> those are feathers. <laughs> That's awesome. But thank you. <laughs> Gosh. Well, he likes the feathers in your hair really that's the truth there we go well thank you again ladies um i, I hope thank you all you. have a wonderful weekend um if you're in southern california try to stay dry i actually see that the sun is out not for long not at my Probably house not. <laughs> supposed to, where supposed are you laura around. where am i i'm in i'm in los angeles i'm in the west adams area near uh, culver city Okay. I'm in the valley. I have to go out and get my car. Yesterday I was driving and my windshield wiper broke. Oh my God. But well, it was really timing. good. I was just a couple blocks from the dealer. But by the time I got there, my <laughs> windshield wiper was totally wrecked. Oh gosh. <laughs> so I have to go Ooh. get my car today in the rain. <laughs> it's sunny well, in my part of the valley, but if I look to the north, the sky is just it's black. coming in again. Well, I'm near you, Laura. I'm in West LA. So if you hurry, you might be able to get to your car before it rains again. Yeah. We had a rainbow the other day. This has been unbelievable. Oh. This weather. I Anybody get bit. snow where they are? My son is I know it's Tuesday. snowing in Riverside County. Wow. Yeah. yeah. On the Good news today, they you. showed I-5 was closed. Oh, it is. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. The grapevine? Yeah. They I-5 is yesterday. closed. And 14 is also closed. That goes to Palmdale. Oh. Some, some of our relatives were trying to come from Palmdale to Los Angeles, and it, the freeway is closed. Oh, so part of the 15 is closed, going to Las Vegas? They had yeah. snow. A good portion of the San Bernardino Mountains are under a severe blizzard warning right now. Yeah. And... Yes. The road blocked. Unreal. Well, I know the year the in 2019, um, I had just come back from Japan the day before Thanksgiving, and um, my oldest son was on his honeymoon, and my youngest son and I were going to go up to our friends in Canyon Country to have Thanksgiving with them, and a storm came in, and there was nothing we could do. We couldn't get up there. So um, on Thanksgiving morning, we got together and you know, opened his freezer and said, well, what are we having for Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> we found turkey meatballs. As of seven this morning, I think in Big Bear or right around Big Bear, they had 81 inches of snow. What? what? They had gotten 81 inches of snow. That's crap. Wow. That's insane. Insane. Well, it's a good year for skiing, folks. Yes, skiers love it. Oh, yeah. They can't get there. <laughs> well, eventually you'll be able yeah. to get there. <laughs> well, anyway. All I want, everybody just stay safe, you know? Yes. Just yeah. stay safe. Laura, did you get your windshield wiper fixed? Well, it's fixed. I have to go pick up my car. It's cost me like $400 to fix them. <laughs> But, no, but you got to have windshield oh work. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you oh my do. Gosh. What made it break? Did they tell you? Well, it looked like one arm, one wiper got stuck. It stopped moving. I thought maybe the motor broke, but it didn't. But it stood. It was sticking straight up, and then the other wiper was moving and kept hitting it, and it oh, broke. Because oh I tried to, I turned them off, but then I couldn't see anything. No kidding. In traffic. There's nowhere to pull yeah. for anything. Oh, so, terrible. Right there. Well, well, ladies, I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you so much. Everybody you. stay safe. Thank and you. Stay dry. Heather, thank go you. get some sleep. I am. I turned off the video <laughs> because I kept nodding yeah. off and thought that's ridiculous. So. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. 
Okay, see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.